up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. Alright, second last episode of the series on visual anthropology, which is a very broad term for research done in anthropology that has something to say about vision, or about visual imagery, or about being seen. It's about how visual media is produced and received, how visual media can be used in anthropological research. Importantly, we're not just looking at images and the process of seeing them kind of in isolation. We're always looking at those things in context and the context that I'm most interested in and what I've structured large parts of this series around are culture and patterns of social inequality. So this episode will be a brief kind of overview of what anthropologists have said about those two things in light of the visual. So at this point, I want to say a little more about the history of anthropology that I covered way back in episodes three and four. In many ways, visual anthropology kind of picks up where that story left off, uh, especially with this concern over representation. So I'll talk a bit about what representation is in an anthropological sense, and then the crisis of representation, and then the politics of representation. And I'll bring that back to visual anthropology. And uh, just to give credit, this next segment is based on a blend of my own thoughts and an article called The Politics of Representation by Gabrielle Vargas Satina. There are four main types of representation in anthropology. There are archives, exhibitions, anthropology itself, and ethnography as a method. First one is archives, archival materials, stuff that we find in the filing cabinets of museums or government offices or businesses or media outlets, any kind of document from the past that we can use to reconstruct the past. Next one is exhibition materials. Unlike archives, these are things that were intended for public display. Um, it could literally be materials from exhibitions, but also anything else that was displayed to the public in some sense around the time that it was made. Next kind of representation is anthropology itself. This might be a bit of an obvious point, but anthropologists use representations found in prior anthropological research in putting together their own observations based on their own research. And number four, of course, ethnography. Um, for most of us, the most important part of representation the original material that you get on local level culture from doing long-term participant observation field work. As a sidebar, there's the field of ethnographic film, which is a topic of its own, so it's a bit outside but closely related to visual anthropology. I don't have anything especially deep to say about ethnographic film. It's, as the name suggests, it's when anthropologists make movies. Um, and the way they've made movies and how that's changed over the years has really followed the same kind of trajectory as the history of anthropology in general that I've addressed throughout this series. So at first it was about documenting the so-called truth about non-Western cultures. Uh, now it tends to be about things like the complexity and the unpredictability of culture. Uh, some of it gets very experimental. Um, but just as one illustration of that history, the film Nanook of the North from way back in 1922. This is an American silent film called Nanook of the North. Sometimes this gets described as the first ethnographic film, or even the first documentary, uh, just because it is supposed to be an objective account of the everyday lives of an Inuit family. Um, even though the filmmaker was not an anthropologist by training, and the people in the film were acting, it's held up as an ethnographic film, or even as the first one, or even as the first documentary. Now, in fairness, the filmmaker, Robert Flaherty, knew the people in the film personally, and he spent a lot of time with them, uh, before shooting to try to learn about their culture as, as an insider, which is pretty close to the ethnographic method, I guess. But still, I think it's quite obvious that if he had used the same approach, so, you know, immersing himself within a community, but then shooting a, uh, you know, a, 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 a film with actors, if he did that about, you know, a, a white middle class family in Chicago, for example, I'm sure that would not have been considered ethnographic, whether in 1922 or even in the present. Um, and it certainly would not be described as a documentary. 
but because he was writing about a non-Western group, a small-scale society, this was uh, the original ethnography, the original documentary film, according to some. I know it's a good point to cycle back to my thoughts on bias and objectivity that I've been coming back to here and there throughout the series. I'm going to quote Vargas Satino on this. She writes, Since ethnography relies on the first-person experiences of ethnographers, politics is at the heart of the anthropological endeavor. Uh, that's true for ethnography, and it's also true for many other types of representation as well. So let's take, for example, archives, the process of putting books on shelves or documents in file folders or those folders in cabinets. All that might seem at first like a fairly straightforward or even objective exercise, or at least something that's not especially interesting in and of itself, or that kind of generates meaning in and of itself. Every topic has a call number, you figure out what the topic is, and then you give it an appropriate call number, and then you put it where it's supposed to go. Well, you know, a big deal, right? But if you ever take a course, for example, in information studies, you'll see that it's not that simple because politics is also at the heart of sorting and storing archival and information uh, materials as well. So to the point that some theorists say there's no real separation, this is going a bit far perhaps, but some say there's, there's no real separation between the storage system and the stuff that's being stored in it. So it's all a part of a network that we use to order reality and information. So you might hear of actor network theory in some more advanced courses or in grad school, for example. Some theorists take it even further to say that there's no real separation between the storage system and the researcher. They're both actors in this network. The researcher is a human actor and the storage system is a non-human actor. And the idea is there are two actors in this reciprocal relationship with each other. So the storage system shapes the kind of knowledge the researcher will find, and in turn that, that shapes the researcher and the researcher's behavior as, as a user of the system. To take a familiar example, um, hip-hop music. There, this wasn't seen as a legitimate topic, really, until about the late 1980s. There weren't any serious scholarly books about hip-hop until... The late 80s, um, and those were very rare at that point, but by that point, the art form was already about 15 years old. Um, now there's at least one journal of hip-hop studies. I assign articles from it in some of my courses when I teach in person. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a serious topic now to, to call yourself a hip-hop scholar and publish on hip-hop, but that wasn't the case until relatively recently. Um, there wasn't you know, a spot on the shelf for books about hip-hop. They were just kind of lumped in with rock music or popular music up until the late 1980s. So um, it's an example of you know library systems, storage systems kind of developing in tandem with uh, the way that people you know use use that material and what kind of information that they're looking for. So that was all a bit of a tangent, but we'll come back to some of it um, a bit later on. But back to ethnography, uh, the main source of representation in anthropology, as Vargas Satina puts it, because ethnography relies on the first person experiences of particular researchers. Politics is at the heart of the anthropological endeavor. That was a new idea as of the 1970s or so. Before that, it was mainly taken for granted that studying culture by immersing oneself in it was something you could do as a kind of objective science. But nowadays, we look at it like this. This is the process by which knowledge is made in anthropology. So to start, you have the anthropologist's own personality, identity, uh, personal convictions that shape what they want to study. And then you have the social, the political, the cultural context in which they do that research. Um, all of this shapes who they will talk to, what those interactions will look like, the questions they will ask, the questions they can ask, and what they record as data. Um, and then when the anthropologist goes back and analyzes all that data and writes it up as prose or you know uses it as the basis of a documentary film, for example, Yet again, it's all filtered through these, these ideas and beliefs uh, another time. And finally, it's all, uh, to quote Vargas Satina again, it's, it's all shaped in a result that is understandable within a current cultural, social, and political environment. So at that point, the data becomes presentations, papers, articles, books, videos, etc. Uh, the sociologist Bruno Latour calls these immutable mobiles. So the idea is when you, when you publish a book or, or produce a film, at that point, it's, it's done. The representation is, is finished. Um, others will critique it, and they can you know, use it to influence their own work, 
but they can't edit your original work. You, you, you can't you can't edit it either. It's now immutable. Um, I mean, I could you know pull this video back off of YouTube and redo it, but really this video in and of itself, once it goes up on YouTube and it's public, it's done. It's an immutable mobile. Um, Books also, on, on this note, can move around the world and around discourse. So they're mobile and they feed into the research design and the methodology of other studies. Um, none of this is an objective process. And I think 21st century anthropologists are especially aware of this in their own discipline, but we can see this is of other disciplines as well. And being attuned to how these filters work is what we call the politics of representation. <laughs> So how did we get from assuming that field work and representation are, are objective to looking at power relations at every step of the process of doing field work and making representations and also making all of that part of the representation itself? Well, to answer that in full, it's complicated. This would require a, a series of PhD dissertations, lots to say about it. But there's an answer that is good enough for our purposes in one video, in one introductory series, and here it is. The short version is anthropology was forced to respond to a series of huge geopolitical shifts since the 1960s, which triggered new ways of viewing research beginning around the 70s and into the present. So we'll start with the first of these major shifts, decolonization. Uh, official European colonialism was almost completely done by the 60s. Some of the former colonies won independence gradually or through kind of legalistic processes. Others won independence through war and revolution. To summarize how that affected anthropology, uh, one of anthropology's main topics and main ways of knowing about the world was now gone. Um, in many ways, anthropology had been the study of colonialism and colonial relations, whether it was supportive of those relations as it was you know, in its early days, or critical of them as it often was towards the end. Um, this led anthropologists to the big question of, you know, what's the point of even studying so-called other people? Um, and other, of course, is now one of those things that we always put the scary quotes on every time we say or write it. Um, a lot of this goes back to a volume called Reinventing Anthropology, put together by Del Himes in 1969. Uh, Himes said anthropology should become the study of human problems far and wide, rather than studying particular cultural groups just for the sake of documenting them. So the kind of anthropology that I do, that this series you know, very much comes out of, is pretty much what Del Himes was saying. It's the study of human problems far and wide, not just kind of studying cultures just to study culture. And that gets right down to details like um, the kinds of grammar we use to talk about groups of people. So the idea of the ethnographic present, um, writing in the present tense about people we're writing about, basically. So, you know, verb tense matters. If you phrase everything such as they do or they have or they are, uh, writing that way reduces and hides a lot. So as, as one uh, anthropologist, Roni, puts it, the ethnographic presence uh, presupposes that the people studied are timeless and establishes the anthropologist as hidden observer, akin to the natural historian in that he or she stand, uh, stands at the peephole into a distant past. So it hides the dialogue that happened between the anthropologist and the people uh, who are the subject of the, of the study. And, uh, you know, pronouns, verb forms in the third person, they, according to Fabian, they, they mark an other outside the dialogue. So looking critically at details like this was one key part of what's called the crisis of representation in anthropology. Which is kind of confusing because crises are bad things, usually, but in my opinion, this was a good crisis, I guess. It, it needed to happen because those old ways of viewing, you know, so-called other people were never great to begin with, and they had less and less of a place in a changing world as time went on, especially when official colonialism was pretty much over. I'll go through a few more of the challenges to that old colonial way of viewing the world. One was the emerging field of post-colonial studies, uh, a huge area of study. Some of the better known scholars' uh, names you might recognize include Frantz Fanon, Edward Said, and Gayatri Spivak. Uh, they questioned Eurocentric history books, they questioned the top-down perspective of much of the social sciences, they studied how the history of colonialism still shows up in everyday life, both in the former colonies and in the former colonial powers alike. Closely related is the field of feminist anthropology, which came into its own by the 1970s. 
feminist anthropology began by looking at gender bias and gender discrimination, both within the societies that anthropologists studied and within anthropology itself. They drew attention to what they called androcentric bias or male-centered bias. Um, they also foregrounded women's experiences with things like childbirth and child rearing and uh, other forms of domestic labor that in the past hadn't been taken seriously as topics of study. Uh, there's a lot more to say about this, but the point for now is that feminist anthropology was yet another challenge to the old way of viewing culture as something static that you can just study objectively. Around the same time, we saw new ways of approaching ethnographic writing. One of the more influential was interpretive anthropology, which I've described briefly in the past. Clifford Geertz gets a lot of the credit for this. He said anthropology is not this objective science and never could be. Uh, the anthropology is not an objective detached researcher, but rather, in, in Geertz's words, an author who calls on his or her own feelings, impressions, and writing skills to produce ethnographies. To make things more complicated, Marcus Fisher, Clifford, and others in the 1980s said that even if an anthropologist could be objective, culture can't be documented in that way anyway, because they said culture was not this fixed, given reality that you can document through scientific methods of observation and experimentation. Cultures are not bounded holes. And a lot of this kind of dovetails with postmodernist and poststructuralist uh, literary theory, which says kind of the same thing about knowledge in general, not just anthropology. Um, the most common critique of these approaches is basically that they became rabbit holes. So if culture is too fluid and too unpredictable to document, and if no one can say anything that isn't shaped by who they are and where they're at, well then, what's left to do? I guess just theorize about theory, which is what a lot of this work started to look like, in my opinion. So a lot of anthropology by the 80s became kind of unreadable, um, unless you also happen to be well-versed in postmodernist and post-structuralist literary theory. Um, some of it reads almost like poetry, and the focus becomes almost autobiographical. It's, it's more about the anthropologist's experiences in the field than about the field itself. So it's a, cre it's a critique that I've made myself in the past, uh, sometimes fairly, sometimes probably unfairly. And if you take an upper year course with me at some point, we can talk about it in more detail. But for now, the point is, all of this was one more ingredient in the crisis of representation. Another big shift comes with globalization in the late 80s and 90s. That's not when globalization started, but it's the breakup of the USSR in 1991 that was this key moment in globalization that some say kind of marked this new era in globalization. You still hear the phrase, the third world, and let's, let's do the scare quotes, the third world. You still hear that even though it's obsolete. Um, it's been replaced by ideas like, uh, these are all in scare quotes, but I'm not going to keep doing it because it gets annoying. Um, the concept of the third world has been replaced by ideas like, developing countries or the global south or post-colonial societies um, depending on I guess your politics or your field of study but here's why the idea of the third world is obsolete uh, before 1991 there was this idea of a three world system the first world meant well-off capitalist countries basically the second world meant communist countries and the third world meant everywhere else so for the most part poor countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia that were former colonies. After 1991, with the, 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 the breakup of the USSR, there's not really a second world anymore, and global capitalism takes over almost worldwide, uh, neoliberalism in, in particular. As I've shown throughout this series, that hasn't been nice for many people in the former third world, not that things were great for them before all of this either. Um, in terms of anthropological research, which is the focus of this episode, um, as had happened during decolonization, the world that anthropology was designed to study had fundamentally changed yet again. So what does it mean now to do, to do research among cultural groups who are struggling to survive in a world where one economic model has almost completely taken over? Do you continue to try to just document reality? Do you use your research and your expertise to advocate for those people and their struggles? Do you keep writing about culture like it's a novel or an autobiography or a poem? Um, you know, I'm simplifying things a bit and I'm betraying some of my own personal bias, of course, but the point is this, uh, the, the, the breakup of the three world system is yet another challenge to the idea that there's one reality and that we can document it objectively using scientific methods.
And we haven't even talked about the internet yet, even the very slow, very limited, and by today's standards, kind of useless internet of the 1990s. Uh, this was called the digital revolution at that time. Culture was now moving around the globe at an unprecedented speed and depth, and so the line between local culture and global influence that was always a blurry line anyway, but it became, it became even blurrier with the internet um, by about the, the mid-1990s especially. And to top it off, now the people whom anthropology traditionally studies can now speak for themselves like never before. So if any group of people anywhere in the world can represent themselves through digital media, what use is anthropology? Well, there are many answers to that question, and uh, it's my series, so I'll give you my answer. Uh, basically, I think that Anthropology is still very useful if it sort of lives up to what Delheim suggested in 1969, if it becomes the study of, you know, human problems worldwide and not just culture for the sake of studying culture. Because as I said, any cultural group is perfectly capable of representing itself, um, especially, you know, through digital media. So anthropology for that purpose, there's, there's not much use for it anymore. Um, and it was, you know, most of the time colonial and patronizing to begin with. But anthropology as a way of studying problems that humans face at a global scale, that I think is still pretty useful, and I tried to highlight research throughout this series that, that does that. So now I want to show you some case studies in visual anthropology that I think are especially interesting, and that I think are responses to this crisis of representation, that I think managed to hold on to what's good about anthropological methods and get rid of a lot of that old uh, colonial baggage. One of them that I find especially exciting is this new emerging, uh, you know, subfield, I guess, of the graphic novel ethnography. Uh, University of Toronto Press has a whole new series of them that they've just started. So far, only one of them is available, but there are apparently three more coming later in 2020. Uh, the one that's out now is called Lisa, a story about medical promise, friendship, and revolution. This one is about a friendship between two teenage girls living in Egypt during the 2011 revolution. There's Anna, uh, the daughter of an American oil executive who lives there, and Layla, who is the Egyptian daughter of the Egyptian concierge who works in Anna's building. Uh, the story follows them through a few years of their lives leading up to the revolution in 2011, and a large part of the story is the health crises that are affecting both of these girls' families. So it is a graphic novel, but it was co-authored by two professors, uh, one of them an anthropologist, the other a, a scholar of science and technology studies, who also has training in anthropology. Um, and it's it's a graphic novel, but it is very ethnographic. It's, it's a vivid portrayal of Cairo at the time, and also of how illness is experienced through culture. So one of the co-authors has a background in medical anthropology, and uh, that certainly shows. So... As an anthropologist who, you know, once had dreams of being a comic book artist, I, I find all of this very exciting. Uh, since the 1990s, there's been this cultural shift that saw the medium of comics and graphic novels eventually being taken seriously as legitimate forms of art and, and literature. We weren't allowed to read comics or graphic novels in school in the 1990s. In fact, graphic novels wasn't even a term that most people have recognized or understood. It was just comic books. A graphic novel was like a, a long comic book. Um, didn't matter what that comic book or graphic novel was about. It could be a story aimed at eight-year-olds about uh, turtles that, that train kung fu. Or it could be a graphic novel adaptation of Shakespeare aimed at an adult audience. Either way, didn't matter. Um, it was text combined with pictures therefore it was a comic book and comic books did not count as as reading for educational purposes um that shakespeare example i chose that one because it's especially ridiculous because plays are supposed to be performed of course so by making young people read the scripts of shakespearean plays in school you are you know making them read something that was supposed to be entirely visual with no visual aids and then if someone takes that and adds a visual element back into it, such as drawings, making a, you know, a Shakespearean graphic novel. Somehow that invalidated the whole thing, and it became just comics, and so it wasn't allowed in school, and kids had to read just the, the plain text Shakespeare play. Um, it probably shows that I'm still mad about arguments I had with teachers and school principals in, uh, like, 1993. 
But anyway, back to the point. Um, it amazes me, I think, that you know, 25, 30 years later, I can now assign comics in university courses that I teach, and it's not a problem at all. In fact, it, it's, it's encouraged. It's seen as a good thing to you know, bring experimental kinds of media into academic courses, and uh, I try to do a little, as much of that as I can by assigning these comic book ethnographies where possible. Next example of the promise of visual anthropology, I think, is with opening up the concept of archives. So for that, I want to quote a Canadian literary scholar named Karina Vernon, who describes archives as, as our shared collective social memory. And she notes that they're especially important in documenting racialized urban histories. It's a similar idea to nostalgia, as Lawrence Ralph describes in Renegade Dreams, uh, the ethnography of, of gangs and community organizations in a low-income Chicago neighborhood that I discussed in detail in, in episode 16, The Frame. Uh, according to Lawrence Ralph, nostalgia is what he calls an historical emotion. It's a longing for a home that no longer exists or never existed, and it's especially powerful in places that are stigmatized and in some cases disappearing, places that are treated like they don't matter, but they do matter a lot to the people who live in them. Uh, places like Toronto's Regent Park community, where my academic research began, uh, the subject of episode 15. Um, and so there are now these informal, often unrecognized archives of these places that academic literature is starting to take increasingly seriously. And those kind of traces of archives show up in, in people's memories, in, in literature, in, in YouTube videos, and in some academic work. Um, visual media is key to that kind of unofficial archiving, and visual anthropology has lately been good at taking those practices seriously and kind of amplifying them. It was March 28, 1980. I remember the date because it divides our lives into the time before the mill shut down and after the mill shut down. My dad's mill was only the first of many to close. When I was a kid, thousands of people worked in the mills. Now not a single mill is left in Chicago and all those jobs are gone. One example is Christine Wally's Exit Zero, a study of deindustrialization in the United States, which I've addressed in the episodes on urban anthropology and a couple others. Uh, to review, industrial jobs tend to be the best paying, the most secure, and the most unionized of uh, working class jobs. So when entire communities, cities, regions lose those jobs, the results are very destructive. It caused a lot of downward mobility. It caused the abandonment of entire neighborhoods and this massive cultural change in American cities and you know some Canadian cities as well. Uh, some anthropologists have studied the cultural effects of deindustrialization. And one example is Christine Wally's book, Exit Zero, Family and Class in Post-Industrial Chicago. There is a documentary film that goes along with that written ethnography in which the anthropologist spends a lot of her a lot of time uh, interviewing her father, who was a, a former industrial worker who lost his job as, as a part of this process. It's very powerful stuff, uh, powerful way of archiving a community that is, uh, you know, often seen as a place that doesn't really matter. It only existed because there were industrial jobs nearby, and now that the jobs are gone, it's as if that place doesn't matter. But it is a community. It matters to the people who live in it. And for another example, where is Fort McMurray? The camera as a tool for assembling community. Uh, Fort McMurray, for those who don't know, is a town in northern Alberta, Canada, that exists in its current state pretty much because of the oil sands, which is this huge and very destructive extraction operation. So Fort McMurray is not exactly a beautiful place to visit by many people's standards, um, and it made international news, especially in 2016, with this devastating wildfire that displaced uh, about one-fifth of the town. But it's still a real place where people live, and wherever people live, they build community and they make places matter. So a team of ethnographers went to Fort McMurray and gave a bunch of youth some cameras to document the place. They asked them to document community and, uh, in their words, what it means to live in the shadow of one of the world's largest resource extraction complexes. And they found that not only was visual media, in this case amateur photography, not only was it good at documenting um, community in the first place, it was also an act of community building itself. So archiving as a way of saying something critical, but also something empowering about the place in which these youth lived. And I'll pick up on some of those themes in the next brief episode, The Anthropocene, uh, last episode of the series coming a bit later on this week. Thanks for watching.